All right, uh, welcome to the Mountaineer Farm Talk. Uh, this is JJ Barrett, the Ag Extension Agent in Wood County, West Virginia. And also we have uh, with us Ben. Ben, how are you doing this morning? Good, how are you doing JJ? Doing great. We have uh, Evan Wilson over in, uh, in Cabo and Wayne. What's up this morning, Evan? Hanging in there, Friday. Good. Join us every Friday at 10 a.m. for the Mountaineer Farm Talk, the voice of West Virginia agriculture. We were formerly called the Cow Cowboy Coffee Break. This week, our special guest is Dr. Ray Smith from the University of Kentucky, and he is focusing on treating pasture as a crop. Dr. Smith will be discussing managing pasture productivity through fertility and rotational grazing to increase profitability for livestock producers and maximizing animal health. Are you interested in livestock nutrition, animal health, forages, pasture improvement, commodity markets, crop production, health, mental health issues, gardening, horticulture, or any other topic related to agriculture and farming? Uh, if you are, join us every Friday here at 10 o'clock for the Mountaineer Farm Talk. Uh, we have with us this morning, Dr. Ray Smith from the University of Kentucky. Uh, Ray, how are you doing this morning? Doing great, good to be with you this morning. Is that, is that okay, or do we need to call you Dr. Smith? Oh, please use Ray. Okay. It's just the students that need to say Dr. Smith, just to okay. teach you a little bit of respect. Yeah. There we go. Um, uh, well, Dr. Smith is currently uh, serving as an extension professor, professor and extension forage specialist at the University of Kentucky. Um, he formerly served in similar positions at Virginia Tech and the University of Manitoba. And he is the former president of the American Forage and Grassland Council and former chair for the International Grassland Council. Uh, I'm assuming, Ray, that your uh, plant and soil sciences major, that's what your, your uh, doctor is in, or give us a little background on that before we get going. Well, I did my doctorate at the, in master's at University of Georgia. And so my study was in um, plant breeding, developing new alfalfa varieties and, and fescue varieties, and then yeah. also just forage management. So, um, but it was plant and soil sciences is the, is the overall area. Okay. And, uh, and just one last, uh, another question. What is your background? You grew up on a, grew up on a farm? Actually grew up north of Atlanta in uh, the suburbs of Atlanta, Marietta. But my yeah. uncle farmed in middle Georgia, and so I enjoyed spending summers down on the farm there. So that was my real introduction to agriculture. And then going into grad school, um, you know, I guess my real goal was making a difference. And that, that was my interest in getting, in getting into agriculture in a more formal way. And it really enjoyed um, my career over the last 30 years, um, particularly in extension. When I was in Canada at the University of Manitoba. I did a lot of teaching, a lot of research, but what I enjoyed most was helping farmers. And I get to do that um, all the time, helping farmers and county agents um, here at the University of Kentucky. Oh yeah, us county agents, we rely heavily on our extension specialist. Um, and you, of course, were a colleague with uh, Ben Goff. Um, ben, you uh, have a few questions that you want to ask uh, Ray. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling here. Ray, thanks for agreeing to uh, be a, be a uh, speaker today. And so one of the, we were kind of debating on topics, what to do. And then with pasture, it seems like a lot of time when we go out and talk to producers, um, they don't really have a tendency not to think of pasture as a crop. So I'm hoping, starting off, can you answer this for me? It's an age-old question. Is pasture a crop or not? Good question, Ben. And... And I'm, I find the same thing. A lot of people just pasture is where you turn animals out and you hope they'll gain some weight, but you figure that you're probably gonna have to supplement before long. And it, it really struck me when I was in New Zealand a few years ago and I was visiting with different farmers. The guy that was showing me around, you know, I kind of just asked him, you know, why are people so serious about their grazing management and, and serious about how much production they have on their pastures? And he's he looked at me like, why are you been asking that question? And he said, well, we treat pastures as a crop. And, and it, 
threw me for a minute. And then I thought about, well, what if I was talking to a big crop producer in the U.S. growing corn or soybeans? Would he just hope for the best? Would he just throw a little bit of fertilizer out every other year and hope for the best? No, he would really make sure he's fertilizing the soil test recommendation. He would make sure he's using good weed control. And so in my mind, treating pasture like a crop is, is really just thinking about it that way and really thinking about how am I gonna you know, make the most money? How am I gonna provide feed the cheapest to my animals? And, and that all comes from doing that. That's, I mean, excellent point, Ray. I mean, that's what it seems you hit the nail right on the head what we were thinking with this. You know, wh why do you think there's kind of that difference in mentality between producers? I mean, I, I always kind of compare it to a yard versus a crop. I mean, is it just kind of a, I mean, as forages, we are kind of an under, under less visual, underappreciated crop. Um, so, I mean, what, what's your thoughts on why that is? And, you know, how are those two crops similar? How are those pastures similar? The management of pastures similar yeah. in terms of a, I've, a I've, I've thought about that some and, you know, pasture is going to going to be there uh, kind of whether you put a lot of management into it or not. So um, if, if you don't fertilize this year, it's not like it's going to all die. Um, and you don't see as, you know, big a yield difference over time. It's harder to measure yield. Um, so it's kind of just... Um, uh, particularly most of our pastures are, are perennial grasses and, and clovers and so and so they're just there and they don't respond as quickly to management uh, whereas a crop if you don't fertilize corn then you're going to have half the grain production if you let the weeds take over you're going to have half the production you're not going to stay in business for very long so with, with with crops we just see what we're doing a lot quicker we see it a lot quicker in our you know in our wallet uh, Whereas pastures, we don't see it as quickly, but it doesn't mean it's not it's not as important. It's not as current, yeah. So, look, so you know, I'll, I'm a forage agronomist by training and stuff, so I think you know we're the best of the agronomists. But you know, <laughs> jokingly, but uh, um, you know, really, it's it's management. It's a little more difficult than other crops. You mentioned there's we have a little bit more buffer to less yields. But in terms of management, we still have the same fertility. Um, we also got the animal component. You know, you talk a little bit more about how, you know, how vital that animal component is to uh, pasture production, not just from a, not just from a uh, animal production standpoint, but also from a pasture production standpoint. Yeah. You know, remember when I was in school and one of the professors, he said, the only real value, kind of economic value for pastures is through an animal. So you're getting, you're getting paid through selling the meat, um, selling the calves, um, selling the milk, um, selling the goats or sheep. And it, it, it was good to hear that. I mean, obviously we can also grow and sell hay, but when we're talking about pasture, it's cycled through the animal. And in kind of keeping that in mind, and so if we're selling the animal, then the best way to make more money with the animals is to provide them the highest quality feed, provide in, them a good volume of feed. Um, you know, I've got some plants behind me. And so you, if you have more growth, then you have more, um, you know, just material for the animals to eat. If you have it in the leafier stage, it's higher quality. They're gonna, they're gonna gain more weight. Um, and so kind of always keeping the animal in mind, um, if you end up with a little short plant like the Kentucky bluegrass back there, um, you graze closely, um, then you're not going to get as much production or you're going to have to provide a lot more land for them. So just kind of always keeping the animal in mind. And the way to keep them in mind is to be, I've heard people say, I'm a forage farmer um, rather than I'm a beef cattle producer. And if, if you provide good forages, um, then you have very good odds of, of doing well with your, with your cattle production or other livestock production. Yeah, uh, grass grows grass. That's what, or grass grows cash is probably what we should say. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, compared to other crops with pastures, though, we're not really most times worried about maximizing production. I just had this conversation with this morning about mm -hmm. producer, but I was hoping you collaborate on it. We're, you know, we don't want maximum value or maximum yield, right? Usually. You know, really good point. I mean, if you're growing corn, you know, you want to shoot for. 200 bushels an acre or, or more, depending on what kind of ground you have. Uh, with pasture, um, 
you want not just yield, I mean, you do want some yield, but you want quality uh, because you can grow, you know, the tall fescue I've got behind me there is growing good and tall and has seed heads. And so you're gonna get higher yield if you cut for hay, but it's not gonna provide as much nutrition. So um, you want quality, you want production, you wanna compromise between the two. Um, the other thing is you want production for the whole season long. If you are growing something that has great yield in May and early June, and then it, and then it stops production for the rest of the year, that's not gonna help you much in pasture. So you want something that has good even production. That's part of why we talk about having a mixture of grasses and legumes, is that's a real good way to even out the production. Now, a crop farmer is not gonna mix his corn and his soybeans together, but that's what we do in pasture. We mix them together to get that longer production, to get that higher quality. Um, and then the added benefit of getting the free nitrogen from the clover to the grass, um, um, reducing the need for that nitrogen fertilizer. You know, kind of going on with that, Ray, you know, how vital is it for grazing to get a return on that clover, the nitrogen from that clover? I mean, a lot of times we think of, you know, producers think it's a, it's a free nitrogen, but you know, what actually has to go through that process to actually become plant available? Well, a couple of things I think about, Ben, and then you can follow up if you've got other thoughts. I mean, first of all, when you're putting clover out there, it makes a huge difference to make sure that you've got seed that's pre-inoculated or that you inoculate the seed. So you've got the bacteria, the rhizobia, that actually attach to the roots, um, produce the nodules that fix the nitrogen. Um, so it makes a big difference to have that happening in the first place, that inoculation. Um, making sure that you've got your pH at the recommended levels and you've got your fertility at good shape that's going to lead to the clover being able to not just grow better, but, but fix more nitrogen from the air. So we've got the free nitrogen in the air, close to 80% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, uh, but for the plant to be able to put it in the form it can use, um, it's got to be able to go through those nodules in the roots and fix it. Um, and then, you know, it's not like the clover, you see the clovers over here, um, backwards here with my pointing, but <laughs> you see the clovers over my shoulder and they don't just freely give the nitrogen to the grass. I mean, they want some of it for themselves. So as you manage the pasture, um, you get some nitrogen being given through the root system, but you also have a lot given as the animals are consuming the clover. Um, and then you've got nutrients coming out of the manure, nutrients coming out of the urine, that's going onto the grass. Um, so you, you, you've got that recycling happening. And that's part of using rotational grazing. A lot of benefits for rotational grazing, but one of the benefits is it gets better distribution of the nutrients from the clover to the grass and better recycling of the whole nutrients in the pasture system. Yeah, um, I can't remember if it was Chuck Doggerty at Kentucky or Gary Lacefield, but he had he said that the cattle were the perfect uh, harvesting machine. You got a forage harvester in the front and a fertilizer spreader in the back. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, that's a good I mean, that's pretty what it comes yeah. down to. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we got any questions for Ray? I don't want to just monopolize it, so jump on in here. JJ, you're muted. That was a great question he was having, but I just not good yeah. my lip reading. You're, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, here here in the back in the Mid Ohio Valley, we sometimes maybe maybe a dirty word fescue, um, depending on what your uh, thoughts are on that how do how do the producers near what are your thoughts on managing fescue should we tr should we try to eliminate it and replace it or should we try to work with it and, and uh, use some other management techniques for the uh, end of fight you know Kentucky 31 tall fescue a really good question and you know I've had people tell me well we just need to get rid of Kentucky 31 fescue because it has an end of fight and it has the toxins so there's 35 million acres of um, Kentucky 31 tall fescue across the east. No, we don't need to get rid of it. We've got it. It's useful. Um, we just need to, to, to manage it. And yeah, in certain situations on good soils uh, where you can actually um, replace it, you know, there's some good options. But let me just mention a few things you can do with what you've got already. And that's, that's what most of us um, want to focus on. In fact, I often tell producers, don't think about replanting a pasture or a hay field think about managing better what you have first. And then once you get really good at that, you know, maybe you think about replacement, maybe you think about other things. So 
One of the easiest things to do with, with fescue is to add clover. Um, you, you can see the, the red um, and the white clover a little bit taller there behind me. Um, adding that um, in the easiest way is, is putting it out in February, early March, frost seeding it, um, or putting it in with a no-till drill a little bit later. Um, that's gonna, um, we talked about the nitrogen, but that's gonna dilute the fescue. Um, and there's some recent work that's happened with the USDA lab here um, at University of Kentucky, where they found that red clover has compounds. One of, one of the compounds is called biocannon A. That it not only is, the clover's not only helping the fescue and diluting it, but the biocannon A is acting to overcome the constriction of blood vessels. That's one of the main issues with toxic fescue. The biocannon A in red clover is dilating the blood vessels. Um, so you've got a, you know, you might could say a medicinal benefit of red clover. So you've got a lot of benefits of adding clover. So that's an easy thing you can do. You know, another thing is just grazing your fescue um, so that you're not at the seed head stage like you've got behind me with some of those. Um, that would be um, getting out there grazing before it gets too tall. Um, if you do get a lot of seed heads, maybe that part of your field or that pasture you, you cut for hay or, or you mow because the, the main toxin, the main problem with Kentucky 31 is ergovaline and it's highest in the stem and the seed head. And so keeping that grass in a leafy stage is, a, is another benefit. Um, there's a lot of things in the market now and a lot of things talked about. If you, if you feed this compound, if you feed that compound, then you're gonna get rid of your fescue issues. But the best thing you can do is just manage for a good mixture. Um, manage to have clover with your tall fescue. Um, have a good mineral program so the cattle are in better health. If the cattle are in better health, they'll handle the toxins in fescue better. Um, you'll also have, there's microbes in the rumen that can break down those toxins um, if they're not at too high levels. So manage the cattle well, keep good mixtures in the field, um, keep the fescue at a leafy stage, um, and, you can, and you can do quite well. If you're finding that you're still having some major issues. Your animals are always standing in the pond. They're always in the shade. That's a real indication. Uh, particularly get into May, we get into May and it's not that hot and they're in the pond. That means that they're probably getting that elevated body temperature from fescue. And so in that case, you might think, you know, I really need to have some other options. Uh, maybe I need to plant one of the novel fescues um, or, or maybe I've got some pastures that are much more bluegrass and orchard grass and white clover in. Um, during the time of the year that um, I'm seeing issues, um, I need to have the animals on that. So um, a range of things, but the very best thing is just keeping it in the vegetative leafy stage and, and in adding clovers. Hope Jake, yeah, I had a, a follow-up on that, Ray, with the, uh, yeah. for the, what, what are your opinions on the, or your experience, I guess, with the, with the new novel or endophyte friendly fescues? Do you recommend those? Um, you know, you have a lot of pro progressive producers um, that are maybe wanting to go in and, and you know, go in and do a, um, a kill and go ahead and replace that. Or maybe some have even been adding it to their hay mixtures. What's your yeah. opinion on that? So I, I definitely recommend those. If someone says, I want to get rid of the fescue issues, or I've got just a field that's not doing well and that's a bunch of weeds, and I want to plant something that's a, a good forage. Fescue is really our best adapted forage in this whole region. And the, the novel tall fescues, um, you know, example of um, Jessup Max Q or Laceville Max Q is one right behind me. Um, there's a lot of options out there. Those are really good choices. But just don't think, well, I'll just throw, I'll just get some of that seed and I'll just throw it on top of my pasture and hope for the best. If you're going to plant those, if you're going to go to the effort to, to pay for the seed that's a little higher than Kentucky 31 because it's a very much improved um, variety, then you need to start. You need to start over. And the time to think about planting those in mean, the fall of the year, um, you know, late August, early September is the time of the year to think about it. I mean, the time the time of the year to be doing it. Then you want to think about it now. You want to make sure if that pasture, the Kentucky 31 that's out there right now, you don't let it go to seed because then you're gonna be throwing more Kentucky 31 seed on the ground. So right now be thinking about it. That's the field I'm gonna cut for hay or I'm gonna mow it off. Um, and we've, we've found that um, two sprays of um, glyphosate, um, one mid-July, another one there mid-August, about four to six weeks apart, can do a very good job of killing what's there 
and then you can drill right into that. So in starting over, you know, it, it can be a fairly straightforward proposition. Uh, use that fescue, use that field um, during the spring and the early summer. Just make sure it doesn't go to seed. Um, and, and then that you start spraying it out in, in July and August, and then you reseed and you've got a new stand. Another thing to think about is whether you're replanting a novel fescue or whether you're planting any kind of forage, you want to give it time to establish. Um, you don't want to think about, you know, people often ask me, how quick can I put my animals back out there? I need to wait a month. And I'll say, well, no, you really need to wait a number of months. You really need to be not doing grazing that fall, being limited grazing the following spring. So you get a good sod established. So if you're, if you're, if you kill out the existing sod, um, you, you drill into that, you make sure your soil fertility is good. Um, and then you're not anxious to get cattle out there. You can have a very productive stand. We've seen the novel fescues. Um, I know of a couple of fields that are 12 plus years old. Um, we've had a number of demos in Kentucky that, that are seven, eight, nine years old and still, and still going strong. Right, you know, you mentioned the spraying twice. Is it still the same school of thought to do a spray, some other spray? So spray in the spring, plant a, a tall summer annual crop, and then spray again in the fall. Is that still kind of the school of thought, or is we going, are we going more of this kind of just spray twice? Yeah, method. So the the spray, some other spray is probably the ideal um, because you get rid of the fescue. I mean, you'd be spraying right now and then seeding a summer annual into that like sorghum sedan grass. Then you have summer forage all summer long, high quality forage. Um, you're also shading out the weeds and the fescue. Then you spray at the end of the, the summer uh, to kill out any fescue that's come back up or any weeds and, and to knock back the sorghum sedan and seed again. So Ben, that's, that's ideal, um, but a lot of people on ground, they you know, maybe have trouble getting a good stand of the summer annuals um, or, or maybe the equipment they have and, and it's harder to, to harvest hay off of those. So, you know, the doing two sprays, um, it works almost as well. Um, so it's easy for the average person to, to do that and to think about that. Um, so if someone were to say, what's the ideal? I would say the spray smother that summer annual crop and, and, and spray again before you seed. Uh, but I would say probably 90% is good as far as getting a good stand is, is using those two sprays. Just making sure you don't scrimp on the glyphosate. You use a good high rate so you're killing that fescue. Um, you wait a period of time and you spray again. Not just kind of one quick spray and hope for the best, uh, but you actually do want to make sure you, you killed out the existing fescue and weeds and things and, and you're starting from scratch. No spray, no spray and pray approach. Really hammer it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, kind of the backtrack and talk. Ray really emphasized the seed heads, and I can't express that enough. Some of the work we did at Ray knows about at UK with Glenn Aiken. We actually measured the the ergovaling Ray mentioned in those tall fescue seed heads, and just from when the boot stage until they're actually not even quite mature seed, you saw about a four time you know, a 400% increase in our prevailing, four times as much from the start of that period to the end of period. And it also uh, occurred at a time where these were stalkers, they were going through and actually selectively grazing just these seed heads, you know, uh, probably just because of higher quality, you know, a little bit of a, um, a grain, grain effect on that times. So basically they were going through and selectively picking out this most toxic part of the plant. Now, older, older animals tend to learn to, stay away from those, but that's always a concern. So, you know, make sure controlling those seed heads, if anything else is, I think you mow it if you have to before, um, and definitely a mixture. And right, Ray, the the other option too, a lot of that ergovalent actually breaks down in hay. I can't remember the exact number. Did you have a- Yeah, on, on average, when you make hay and the and <laughs> the hay sitting other drying, the, the sunlight and just the drying effect, you typically drop the ergovalent about in half. And so you still would rather not cut hay at a full seed head stage, maybe more like this plant at a boot stage, then you still have good yield. You don't have as high as ergovalene and you drop the, you drop the ergovalene in half in that, in that hay um, curing process. Um, so that's why we don't have as many issues with hay. But on the other hand, if someone says, well, I want the maximum yield, I wanna let that 
get up really tall. I kind of like those seed heads to get more yield. They can start seeing fescue issues feeding hay in the winter. Uh, even though the ergovalines in half, if it's at a full seed head stage, it could still be issues in the vasoconstriction during the winter. Um, it's not causing overheating in the animals. It's causing frostbite because they're not getting blood flow to the tips of the ears and to the hooves and to the tail. And so, you know, that's where you get the fescue foot. That's where you, you know, lo lose, lose the feet. Um, so uh, make what we tell people in making hay at a cutting at a boot stage or a, or a leafy stage, that's good for the quality and, and that's good for the, I'm reducing the ergovaline. Ray, since we're, we're on fescue, uh, we can't talk about fescue in Kentucky and not talk about horses. So what, what is kind of your general management guidelines for fescue and horses? Well, I would, first of all, with, with horses that are not pregnant mares, then there's very little concern with Kentucky 31 tall fescue. Um, I mean, they will be affected um, at really high levels, um, but horses are able to tolerate um, that, that ergovalian fescue quite well. Um, so your, your pleasure horses, um, the horses that aren't breeding mares, um, there's, there's very little concern. I mean, if you get pure fescue at a seed head stage, yeah, maybe you'd wanna keep, keep your horses off of that. But, um, but if you got a pregnant mare, during the last trimester, um, if you've got some that are, you know, you're you're not, they're not foaling until May and June um, during that last trimester, then then they will have issues if they're on fields that have a um, high percentage of tall fescue. Now it'd be easy for me to say, well, don't put a pregnant mare on a field that has any fescue, but that's almost impossible. So what we talk to producers about is just um, reducing, you know, put them on a field that maybe it's just got um, 10 or 15 percent fescue. It's got a, a good cover of um, bluegrass or orchard grass or clover. And so you greatly reduce what's out there um, for that pregnant mare. So long and short then is the pregnant mares in the last trimester. That's the concern. Um, other horses than fescue provides a great sod, a great footing, um, a great forage. It take a lot of the treading that you see in horse pastures a lot too, right? Yeah, so exactly yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Ready to kind of switch back on gears a little bit. You know, we talked about the op the optimum yield in a pasture. You know, what's the compromise between uh, yield and quality? Uh, mm -hmm. So, what you know, in an ideal cool season pasture like we have in West Virginia and Kentucky, where was that at? Well, we we often talk about a good height to start grazing a pasture is like eight to ten inches. Um, the what plants behind me are getting a little bit taller. Um, with the seed head starting up. But if we look at the vegetative part of this plant, and if animals go in there at, at, at eight inches um, or 10 inches, then you've got a, a good production. You've got good quality. It's also going to grow back quickly. And another key is not grazing down too close because you've grazed close, it's going to grow back slower. Um, I mean, a, a neighbor told me in his lawn, well, I cut it really close. I kind of scalp it because it comes back slower, but we don't want that in our pastures. So grazing to down to three to four inches and then giving a rest period, letting it get up to that eight to 10 inches. That's kind of a, a, a good, good quality, good yield, um, good regrowth. In fact, on our, our grazing sticks that we have, um, we've actually got little guidelines and we say to, to stop grazing when it's there at three to four inches, um, start grazing when it's eight to 10. Now, this is a fancy grazing stick, but really we're just talking about a glorified ruler um, and you can do that measurement yourself or make a mark on your boot if you want to, if that's easier. I, I won't tell Ray, Ed Rayburn you call the grazing stick a glorified uh, oh, ruler. <laughs> don't, don't tell him that, but then we may not get to talking about it. But promote some of the pubs that Ed has done because he's done some great yeah. publications and, and research on um, simple ways to measure yield in pastures. In fact, I pulled up I pulled up Ed's PhD dissertation from Virginia Tech, uh, <laughs> and it's on tall fescue. It's on stockpiling tall fescue, uh, and he studied under some of the best there, like Roy Blazer at Virginia Tech. 
Ray, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned up the grazing stick because that's why I was kind of going with some of this forage budgeting. You know, for someone who's never, we still don't have a lot of producers in the state that really do that. Can you explain what really that is and how valuable a tool that would be to uh, developing a grazing system and using that as kind of a, a, a tool within that operation? Okay. You know, Ben, the, the other day I was kind of saying, um, how do I explain forage budgeting? So I, I Googled it. Um, forage budgets, and, and it popped up a bunch of sh short YouTubes. Um, there was a fellow from New Zealand that was talking about it. So if you want to um, hear some interesting people talking about it, uh, you know, put that in. But the, the real point of a forage budget is determining how much production you have in the pasture, determining how much your animals need, and then you want to make sure that you can supply what they need um, throughout the grazing season and maybe even stretching it out into the fall and winter with stockpiling. Um, so my main point is to, is to try to not, not overthink it, not try to, you know, you might have heard of developing these um, detailed spreadsheets and programs and things like that. The, the simplest way, um, even without taking measurements, is just thinking to yourself, what have you seen in past years with your forage production, with your animal needs? Um, am I able to provide enough for the animals for the full grazing season? Now, taking it a step further in measuring what you have. Now, I've often told people, well, the best way to measure pasture production is you, is you take your hay bond out and you cut the whole thing down and you bale it and you weigh it, but then you don't have a pasture anymore. So something that Dr. Rayburn has done a great job of is developing simple tools and simple techniques um, to determine how much is out there. Um, and, you know, that's where a, a grazing stick would come in and that you're, you're measuring the height of the pasture. And if I go out in this pasture here and I'm gonna discount the seed heads, the top of the seed heads, but the, the leafy part of this is about 10 inches. So I've got 10 inches of growth and a good rule of thumb on that average pasture would be that every inch is about um, 200 pounds of dry matter per acre if you're just measuring it with the grazing stick or with the ruler. And so you say um, 200 pounds, 10 inches tall, that's 2,000 pounds per acre. Um, that's how much I have. Um, and then in thinking to yourself, well, how do I um, budget that out? You've got your animals. Um, if it's a 1,000 pound animal, they're going to be eating about um, 25, 30 pounds a day, um, it's pretty easy to do the calculation. You can kind of do it on the back of a napkin. Um, I've, I've got animals eating 30 pounds a day. How much do I provide for them? Now they're gonna trample a little bit, waste a little bit. So maybe I figure 40 pounds a day. Um, you, can, you can get, you know, the next step would be um, using some of the formulas we've got on the grazing stick. Uh, we've got a publication actually at the University of Kentucky called I'm using a grazing stick for pasture management, and it, it gives some of those formulas that you can put in your yield, put in your number of animals and, and what weight they are, um, and come up with more detail. I've, I've put these and actually uh, Dr. Rayburn's publications on our forage website. Just um, put in Google KY forages, and you get to our forage website and look under grazing, and you'll see these, these publications. Um, I'm probably talking too much, Ben, because I told people to, to keep it simple. Think about what you have, whether you're, even if you're just guesstimating, thinking about your animal needs, and then thinking about supplying what they need. Um, and, and then get more sophisticated as you get more comfortable with your estimates, with the grazing stick, um, with a plate meter like this, and then Dr. Rayburn's plate meter that's a, that's a piece of plexiglass. Uh, he explains that in his, in his publication on um, a falling plate meter for estimating pasture forage mass. He gives actually how to construct it here. Um, again, I've, you all can get those easily from your county agent. Um, I put those at the, the top of that grazing section of our forage website too, if, if you want to um, grab it from there. No, I, th I think I think you hit it nail on the head, Ray. It's sometimes the mass side of it just gets really intimidating for producers, but mm -hmm. You know, it kind of goes back, you know, going back to that treating pasture as a crop, we don't really have a, most people, they can even hay producers, well, I got so many rolls, you know, they have a, a way to estimate yield. 
I mean, this is really a good way to keep track of your yield. Um, mm -hmm. I know Tom Griggs, most people from WU has probably heard this story, but like, you know, he has talked about in the, his some of the work in the West, having some of this records of this forage budgeting helped get, help one of the guys he worked with anticipate a drought. And the guy more or less seeing that drought was coming, seeing that pasture growth was slowing down, was able to anticipate that and buy hay when it was cheaper and mm -hmm. actually end up paying for his salary based on how much money he saved for hay. So I think yeah. it's, you know, yeah. it's not just a, a good budgeting tool to know what you're doing. You have some of these records as you gradually get used familiar with that. You can use that to kind of get more familiar with it, I guess, pasture. Yeah. And I think, you know, we always go by the eyeball method. This is just something a little bit more refined than that eyeball method. No, that's right. And, you know, if you if you keep really good records and, and you know the production, um, not maybe even numbers of yield, but you know how well the pasture that you have is maintaining the animals, the animal numbers, and you've got good records going back the last five years, then you can use that. But often we don't have those records or we have different numbers of animals. And so these, these ways to actually measure it, you know, you may say, well, I don't, that doesn't make sense with the grazing stick and calculations. And do I use 200 pounds per inch or 300 pounds? You know, you can take a, just a square grid that's um, a foot square. Um, I've got a, you know, this is PVC. You could just make it out of a piece of wire, coat hanger, whatever, foot square, uh, take some scissors and Um, so you, you've got a weight, you know, you grab your, buy a postal scale or whatever, or a food scale and you, and you, and you weigh it. Um, ideally, the best thing is to dry it before you weigh it. Um, it could be a microwave. It could be putting it on the food dryer. Um, so if you've got a, if you've got a, the forage in one foot square from your pasture, uh, you just simply would multiply that times the square feet in a in an acre, 43,560. I mean, it'd be better to not just take one square, take several, uh, but figure the, the yield uh, per square foot, multiply that to an acre. And so then you've got exactly what's in there. Um, so there's several ways you can estimate yield. Clip it yourself and dry it and weigh it. Um, use the grazing stick to give an estimate. And I was talking to someone from Missouri one time and these plate meters, Dr. Rayburn, on, on the publication, um, he's got some charts, some of his publications, how you use these plate meters and how you estimate yield with them. And, and I asked this guy from Missouri, I said, well, you know, I want to have the best um, formula to figure out yield. I want to figure out exactly, you know, um, I don't want to know if I've got 2,000 pounds per acre. I want to know if I have 2,150. And he said, you, you know, these are estimates. They're not perfect. But in doing a forage budget, um, if, if we're close, if, if, if we've got the feel that we've got this kind of ton per acre out there, um, that would be the total. Then we want to leave some at the base. We've got 1,000 pounds to work with. And that, that's the kind of numbers we're talking about in, in developing the budgets. And um, then that helps you, as you said, Ben, you know, do I, need to, do I need to buy some hay? Do I need to go ahead and cull some animals? Um, you know, making those decisions. Right. Not to switch gears a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about the the master grazing program you have there in Kentucky, because I know that um, from what we're talking about here today, that as far as treating pasture as a crop, is uh, rotational grazing is is crucial, a, a crucial step in that uh, part of that formula uh, for managing pasture. So you talked a bit about your your. Uh, that master grazing program there in Kentucky? Sure. So one of the hallmarks of the master grazer program <clears throat> is the um, Kentucky grazing schools. And a number of states have grazing schools. The way we use ours, or the way that we uh, put ours on is it's a two-day program where people come and we've had a number of people come from West Virginia. And we have classroom sessions in the morning about um, plant, different types of plant species and managing those species. And in the afternoon, we actually get out there and we actually go through how you measure pasture yield. Um, we give, we, we divide people up into groups and um, give them some electric fence and have them fence off an area. Uh, we tell them that they were gonna, we're gonna give them typically three stalkers that weigh 600 pounds each. And they need to, to fence off the amount of area that they need, that those animals need for the next day. And so that they're not only 
having to do some of these calculations, uh, but but they're having to think about the the, the management of the fence and that they put in a temporary water system. So our goal is is very hands on. Um, we have several different programs in the Master Grazer program, um, but that's the that's the main thing. In fact, um, this coming September we'll have one of those um, close to Lexington. Um, so that again would be on our, our website. COVID is, has made us postpone several of those, but we, we, we figure that we'll have that back in person. Uh, we even have a, um, the Master Grazer program. If you, Kentucky, if you type into Kentucky Master Grazer, you'll get to that website. So that's a whole website um, focused just on grazing management. But JJ, your comment about rotational grazing, um, I haven't talked about that too much. Um, you know, if, if you can give pasture a rest, um, so you give it, you, you work out a way for that plant once you cut it down to be able to rest to grow back, um, that's the best way to increase the production. People often ask me, what do I need to do to have the best pasture? You know, do I, you know, what's the exact fertilizer I need or the exact weed control, whatever. The very most important thing they can do is rest. Um, and if you've got just one big pasture, it's going to be hard to rest it. The animals are going to um, graze certain areas close and not areas other close. So if you can divide that pasture up, um, in fact, if you can even put one fence through the middle and you've got two pastures rather than one and you can rotate back and forth, that's better than just having one. Um, you've got a lot more options if you can make some subdivisions and you end up with, with four pastures or six pastures um, so that you can rotate and so you can have animals you know, um, in the spring of the year when things are growing fast, um, they could graze for four days on one of those pastures. Um, and if you got six in total, um, then when they come off that pasture, it can have 20 days of rest before they come back on it. Um, so we do a lot of teaching about rotational grazing and the benefit of giving a rest um, for regrowth. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Ray, I appreciate that. Uh, I think a lot of times our, our producers and maybe some of us are our, that our farmers are, are guilty as well, that we, as you were saying, they want to say, how do we get more production? And so we're always thinking that we need to buy something or we need to add something. You know, the, a lot of producers say, well, I need to add more fertilizer or I need to, you know, purchase this or I need more lime. And then sometimes some, some, something simple as, why don't you just add more, instead of two pastures, add four or, yeah. you know, do, do add a little watering system and then you can, then you can uh, divide your pastures even further. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's a simpler solution. And you know, the, the, the fertilizer, the weed control, all those are important. But if, 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 if you're overgrazing or if you've got too many head for your land area, uh, the rotation of grazing will help that. Uh, but really think about what your land can handle, improve the management, improve what you've got, and then start um, adding the the fertilizer, adding the weed control. But, you know, if, you, if you've if got a closely grazed pasture, if, if you've got something like this, um, a lot of thin areas, then weeds are gonna come up. Um, you can buy the fanciest and most effective herbicide. Um, but if you've got bare ground, then new weeds are gonna come up. You're gonna be spraying every year um, and you're not gonna be really helping your grass grow. You're just gonna be spending a lot of money. Um, if you could give that a rest and it gets up like this, um, you're going to be way ahead. It's going to compete with weeds better as well. So I can't I can't emphasize that enough. And people often tell me, well, I'm I'm renting land, I'm renting pasture. I I, I can't go and put a, in a bunch of paddocks or a bunch of water systems. But with electric fencing that we have now, um, you know, very very inexpensively, you can divide a pasture up at least in one or two pastures and in temporary went um, temporary water systems for um, you know summer pastures. That that that's quite straightforward to do and you know for the people that are listening to this if, if you say well I just I don't understand that you know check with your county agents um, they, they can help you get started they can help you with publications or hands-on or um, you know like these grazing schools can direct you to some of those things so the resources are out there if, if you're willing to um, to put in the time to learn right you know starting out I know one thing I always talk when people talk about dividing up I tell them start with a temporary fence if they have a big pasture, divide it. Start with that because as soon as you put a permanent fence in, you're going to wish you would have done something different. But yeah. is there any other kind of tips you you can give to people listening about the things they may do to help design or redesign 
uh, their grazing system, like shapes of paddocks, you know, lane lanes or any other kind of setup? Mm -hmm. yeah, good, good question, Ben. And you know that what you said about a temporary fence to start with. Um, first of all, I'd say uh, keep it simple. Um, what you do with fencing, uh, make sure it's something that's easy for you to do and easy for you to manage. Um, and the electric fencing fits into that. Um, you know, paddocks that are more square use less fence. Uh, they're typically easier to manage the animals and a big long paddock um, is gonna take more fencing to cover the same area or to surround the same area. Um, and the animals may well not graze that back part of a real long one um, than a close one. Um, so keeping the paddocks more square is a simpler way, saves you money on fence. Um, laneways, um, you know, you say up my farm is really long and when they get to that very back paddock, uh, I, how am I gonna get them back up to the front? So a laneway would be the way to do that. Um, the limitation with the laneway is they're gonna be walking to that same area every day. And so many producers have found that, that once they get started in rotational grazing, um, they'll say, well, my, my cattle, they know that when I open the gate to give them a new paddock, that they're getting something better. Um, and so many producers end up not using laneways. Um, they're moving animals just from one paddock to the next. And I've heard of a number of people that have said, well, my, my animals will follow me um, to the, they'll walk through a paddock that has good growth to get to the next one um, because, because they've kind of trained to know that what I'm giving them next is the best thing. So uh, many people find that they can lead their animals even through several paddocks that could be grazed, but to take them back up and start at the front. Um, so, and, I, you know, again, there's, there's good resources. NRCS can help you, you know, come up with more detailed design, particularly if you're getting cost share. Um, but I've had over and over and over people say, well, I want to start rotational grazing, but I just, it's too complicated and it's too expensive. And, and I keep hearing that I need to have um, eight or 10 or 12 paddocks. Um, start simple, um, as we talked about, divide, divide at one time. In fact, one of Dr. Rayburn's, his supervisor for his PhD back in the 70s, um, Roy Blazer, he said that he found that the, the greatest improvement from continuous grazing uh, I mean, the, the biggest bump in improvement was when you went to three paddocks. Um, you get a little bit better in um, efficiency when you go to four or five or six, but if you could go from one to three, you, you've got a marked difference in pasture regrowth um, in your ability to manage that stand. So kind of keep that in mind, just, just simple in, in a few paddocks um, will help you a lot. And then is, if that's working for you, um, then as you move down the road, you could make more subdivisions or maybe come up with a little bit more involved watering system. But to start with, you can have a hose on top of the ground and a temporary water to get water to the back part of your farm. Do we have any questions out there from the anyone that's joining us this morning? I'm sure that they that we, we have uh, Dr. Smith here um, as a great resource from Kentucky. Any, any questions out there? Evan, do you have any questions? Not me, actually. I just put up where we farm one place and try to figure out how to divide that up into two or three paddocks instead of just one big field that's too big for the cows to manage in a, in a wise way. Hopefully you're inspired, Evan, after our, our chat. Uh, I am. It just, it's just getting out there and doing it and, and convincing yeah. my father to go along with it, too. Yeah, I, I, right. I, I think that uh, Ray is very correct that a lot of people maybe are a little bit intimidated. They think, well, I don't have enough, um, I don't have enough access to water, or I need to build a permanent fence. And then, you know, a lot of excuses, but just simply uh, splitting the farm into two paddocks. Uh, I mean, like you said, if you've got somewhere you can run a water hose on top of the ground and then, you know, drain it for the winter time. Um, is always a big improvement. Well, I, I know one bite at a time. Yeah, and 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 I think of um, a couple of young farmers when I was at Virginia Tech, and they were in Northern Virginia. Land prices were really high. Um, they only owned a little bit of land, but they found that they could rent land pretty cheap. And so their method of rotational grazing 
was to load up that those animals that they had into a trailer and, and take them to this next property that they had rented for pretty cheap. Um, so yeah, with some effort loading the animals and unloading them, but they use rotation by actually transporting the animals. Um, in fact, in some cases, um, they would they would get that land for, for no cost because they were managing it for people. So rather than someone having to think about, I've got to mow this, um, they were they were providing a service by keeping it grazed and, and that benefited the landowner and that prevented um, benefited the, the, the cattle producer. So, you know, don't lock in your mind that you've got to do it a certain way. It, it may be moving um, animals between farms. It may be um, moving them between, um, you may not have to put a new fence in. You may just, you've been keeping animals in different groups and, and you say, well, I, maybe I'm going to group them all together and then move them between my existing pastures. That, that's actually what we've been doing for 10, 15 years now is moving cattle by trailer to different different fields. Yeah, so you've been rotational grazing without yeah. having a, a fence in there. And so often people don't realize maybe they are already are doing it and, and just some tweaks and some improvements can help them a bit more. Mm -hmm. Ray, always, we always have to ask every guest. Uh, my dad always told me that there's two types of music, country and then Western. So are, are you a big country, <clears throat> you enjoy country music, and what, uh, who, is your, who is your favorite artist? Well, I do enjoy country music, but I, I enjoy more some of the um, contemporary Christian music. So that's more what I listen to, like a K-Love station. Uh, so can't, can't give a particular country artist that's my favorite. Oh, okay. We've, we have a, uh, always had a variety of answers for that. Uh -huh. But uh, is there, do you have a favorite uh, um, contemporary Christian artist? It's one of your favorites, maybe? And, you know, JJ, you, uh, you warned me I may be asked that um, at the beginning of our show, and I got to thinking, I, I don't know if I do. I just um, in, in, I enjoy having music when I'm, when I'm driving between the, all these extension visits. Uh, so. Okay. The, um, of course, I, the, <clears throat> I'm a big Waylon Jennings fan. But uh, I enjoy all, I enjoy all kinds of music. But uh, does anyone have any other questions? Uh, for if you can always join the uh, the chat box. Um, before we finish up here, I just want to uh, talk about our our upcoming some of our our guests. Of course, we have Dr. Smith here today. On Friday, May 7th, we're going to talk about farm finance and loans with Ryan Vaughn from Farm Credit and Matt Taylor from the USDA. He's a loan manager. Friday, May 14th, uh, Rakesh Trandon and Bruce Lloyd will be talking about control of autumn olive and multiple rows. Friday, May 21st, Dr. Lewis Jett uh, is going to be talking about heirloom vegetables for the garden. And then uh, Friday, May 28th, uh, Dr. Carlos Sada is going to be talking about scouting for pests in the garden. So that, that will be some of our upcoming guests for the Mountaineer Farm Talk. But again, we are, are very appreciative for uh, Dr. Ray Smith for coming on the program today. Ray, one last question. One I always get from producers, when is the best time, in your opinion, to look at a pasture when they're thinking about management decisions, things they could do different. Is it the okay, fall? Good. Is it the spring? Kind of throughout the whole year? What's your yeah. opinion? Good question, Ben. And, you know, if you look in the spring when things are greening up, then usually everything looks pretty good and the grass is growing well. So in my mind, to look in the fall, because if you look in the fall, you've got the accumulation of whatever you've done. If you've managed well, it's still looking good. If you've not managed so well, um, you're seeing the effects of overgrazing. If you've got lower fertility, uh, the plants are really struggling by that time. Um, if you've got weed issues, you're often seeing those at their height. Um, so if I was only going to take one time to assess, then I would say fall. Um, and, if, and if not fall, then, you know, maybe kind of um, mid, or, mid or late summer. Um, if you look there in the fall or you're thinking about management in the fall, then you've got time to do a, a soil test that you can get fertilizer down for spring. Um, you've got time to do some late fall weed control. Um, so um, if, you, if you take a look in late summer, you take a look in August and you realize you've got a lot of thin areas, then you've got the opportunity to do some overseeding in September. 
Um, so, so often we look at our pastures in the spring and they look great. And then we don't know what happened when we get later in the year. Uh, yeah, wait later in the year to make your decisions about how things are doing. So good question, Ben. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, Ray, with the uh, talking about fertilizers, <clears throat> I know that in our area, um, a lot of people like to, to be the first people out there in, in March and April, and they put a lot of fertilizer on really early. How do we encourage producers to, to treat the pasture more like a crop where, you know, if you're going to do corn, you don't, you do, you side dress nitrogen, you don't put everything on in the, in the spring and then it is hope for the best. Well, how do we encourage them to do split applications and maybe move some of that uh, fertility or fertilizing more for, towards the fall? Well, I, I guess think to yourself, I want to, if I'm going to spend money on fertilizer, then I want to get the most efficient use. And if you dump it all up there at once, um, phosphorus and potassium won't, won't matter as much. But if you put a lot of nitrogen at once, you get a burst of growth um, and maybe a burst of weeds um, mm -hmm. and, and not as much later on. And if you can give the grass the, the nitrogen fertilizer when it needs it, so giving some in the early spring, maybe some um, later in the spring, and then particularly late summer, fall to get good fall growth, you get much more efficient production. Fertilizer prices are high right now. So um, that makes all the more difference. Um, and, and another thing that I often like to emphasize is, I mean, it's easy to go buy triple 19 and just put it out there because you know that's fertilizer, you know that greens things up, but m taking the effort to get a soil test and finding out what you need. And often you don't need all the components of triple 19. Um, you need more of one than the other. And that's gonna save you money. That's gonna give you more production. Um, so just, just a few things there, um, JJ, to think about. All right, thank you. Ben, do you have anything else? I mean, I think just kind of hit on raising, you, know, you talk about that, um, splitting the applications up. That's the way, you know, we talked about not having all that growth at first part of the year that helps spread that out. You know, before COVID, that was what we always talked about flattening the curve then was we had this big flush of growth in the spring, not much in the fall. That was one way to kind of flatten the, even that throughout the season. So having that nitrogen split up is a real critical part of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the, uh, okay. Well, um, like I said, we really appreciate uh, Dr. Ray Smith being our, our, our guest and I guess if no one has anything else, we will uh, see everyone next week. We're going to have uh, we're going to have farm loan um, management with uh, our guest from Farm Credit and the uh, USDA. So everyone, have a good weekend, and we will see you next week. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Ray.